So we're going to talk a little bit about, um, first off, who I am. And, and this is the second time I've spoken at Open Source Bridge. Um, this is a follow-up to a talk that I did two years ago. I had just finished my computer science degree, and I did undergraduate research in electronic democracy. I went back to school. My original background was as an artist, and I worked in kind of multimedia stuff, participatory art, um, sonic art, and audio engineering. And then I got a computer science degree from the Evergreen State College with undergraduate stuff in, in um, electronic democracy, specifically online deliberation, which is like participatory or, let me see, parliamentary procedures, um, systems engineering for participatory or um, parliamentary procedures. So uh, I worked in that period with um, the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation and CIRL, which is the Civic Intelligence Research and Action Lab. Uh, I'm currently a uh, DevOps engineer in, at Socrata, which is like the world leader in open data for government. So I currently manage infrastructure for open data for all kinds of places. Um, that's not really a part of this talk, my day-to-day -day job is that I just like go in and do like um, infrastructure as code and a lot of um, like code system management. But what I have come to find is that um, a lot of the problems with electronic democracy or a lot of the issues with electronic democracy are in fact infrastructure issues. And it was one of the things that made me an infrastructure engineer. Things like security and authentication and um, Scalability. These are very important issues in electronic democracy. So this talk is actually mostly ideas. I haven't written a lot of code for it. You'll hear me like actually start talking about technical stuff. And one of the reasons I come to Open Source Bridge is because I can dig deep and talk about technical stuff. Um, I'm going to give you a lot of questions instead of answers. Don't expect to come out of here like knowing more. You'll just come out of here with new questions to ask yourself. And my intent in talking is to, per is to perpetuate a common vocabulary of issues and ideas. Now, electronic democracy is very theoretical. And really, it has applications to all kinds of communities. You know, If you have some kind of online community and you want to work with them, one of the things that I'm seeing is that communities that were perhaps more moderated or more handled want to be more um, self-governing. And this is a talk where, if you think about it, you don't necessarily have to have a virtual democracy for whatever kind of community that you have, but you probably want to be more self-governing, if only to reduce your cost of moderation, right? Um, when on a forum or something, when you have to hire a moderator or when you're actually using people from your community, it's a lot of energy goes into moderation. You'll actually hear me talk a little bit here about virtual democracy. So virtual democracy um, is essentially a de jure or a de jure state. Um, when we talk about governments, we can say they're de facto or de, uh, or de jure. And a de facto government is something like a government that has actual territories in it. And a de jure government is one that has just, that may not have material assets. For example, um, France during the occupation during World War II, people could still make treaties and treat France as a nation, but they were in control of actual soil, right? So one of the things we can think about is how much of government actually needs to be physical. Um, is it really necessary, especially in this age where we have different kinds of resources? Those resources may not be oil, they may not be land. We may have human resources. Um, and those things could be like anywhere. They don't have to be geographically isolated. So could you have a nation without having territory? That's kind of a basic question. Some of the things that nations have, though, that make them not just a community are things like alliances and treaties with other nations, immigration rules, like who gets to be a citizen, and constitutions. And constitutions are something I've just started thinking about, about like what kind of documentation is actually handling your community? Where are your written rules? And where is that um, guiding your community in ways that is not just about tribal knowledge or constant conversation? There are some things that we could say, the whole community came together and we decided and we wrote down our rules, right? And then who are citizens? 
potentially of like virtual democracies. Well, we could say communities of conscience. That seems pretty obvious. Um, religious groups, communities of interest. Um, Burning Man, you know, is really interested in self-governance, governance, um, and various kinds of diaspora. You know, there's like 19 million Sikhs worldwide, and there's not, as far as I know, like a Sikh parliament someplace. So there's many cases where there's different ethnic religious groups that could constitute de jure states, but they don't have political tooling. So this is one of the big things that I want you to get out of this talk is the difference between an online community and an online community that has some kind of political tooling and the power that you get out of having a community that would have these kinds of things that would constitute a self-governing community, right? One of them is deliberation. So deliberation is basically just having a discussion and coming to a decision. Second one is voting, whether you want to have a representational democracy or you want to have um, some kind of voting system to actually handle the decisions in your community. Um, taxation, you know, how are we going to support our community? Is it self-supporting? Justice, which is like one of the trickiest things and I've barely started thinking about, but justice is really important a justice system is really important in a government in the way that it, it shapes, in the way that it works with constitution, and it actually shapes the current experience of the citizens and relationships with other states. So a word about this talk. I, the last time I came here, I gave like a 45 minute talk, and I had a little bit of time afterwards to like answer questions. But all of my ideas, are essentially built through collaboration and they're built through dialogue. And what I found is that I just didn't, I wanted more questions. Like the more interesting part of my session was the questions, not the talk, for me at least, right? So this is a long session, but I'm gonna break it down into four, I'm gonna introduce like four ideas. All of them have to do with identity and the way that you allow your users to express their identity within an application. But there's actually a, there's actually a spectrum that we're gonna go through with these four ideas, going all the way from like more traditional ideas about identity architecture, like you have a website, you have a community, maybe you're doing some kind of activism, all the way to the idea of like sovereign virtual nations and what does identity mean in terms of sovereignty. I've been working on these ideas since the last talk. Um, the earliest of them is like two years. And so the way that I'm gonna do this is I'm gonna introduce an idea. We'll try and do like 10 minutes. I'm gonna, it's gonna take me 10, 15, 20 minutes on the longest of them. And then we're gonna talk for like 10, 15 minutes. Any questions you have, anything that seems to apply to your work or any comments, then we're gonna do it. Like the thing about that is that I'm essentially doing a talk in a nonlinear way and it's gonna allow me and you to have like a longer talk and hopefully be more active. But I'm only going to take like 10 minutes of questions in between each one. Then I'm going to cut it off and move to the next idea. And I may put stuff in the parking lot or write it down or do something with it so that I can come back and touch on it later, okay? So first we're going to talk about something that I refer to as impartial identity architecture. Uh, I used to call this IIA, but then I met some linguists and they're like, no, IIA means something else. So I've gotten to this point in my talks where I'm like, DUA, don't use acronyms, because we have enough acronyms, right? Um, and I also, so they're the ones that the linguists are the ones that were like, you should call it imparch. <laughs> so they gave me that. So impartial identity architecture. Um, these are traditional ideas for how identity influences your community and people's roles in their community and the way that the community is actually functioning. So a lot of, thing, a lot of times, like when you go into and build a, a website, you know, you have some point where you have authentication. You might have a password, you might have usernames. Do you have people put their first, their last name? People ask for all kinds of information on this and a lot of it they don't even need. My first number one rule is don't ask people for questions. Don't ask people questions about stuff that you don't immediately need. If you don't need it for your function, then you're gonna be storing it and personal information can be a liability. It's one thing to let people like say something or post pictures or do th things that express themselves, but you really don't wanna be carrying around personal information about people. The best way to be secure is not to have money 
in your bank, you know? It's like nobody's gonna steal what you don't got. So don't collect information that you don't need. Um, a lot of cases, if what you're looking for is you want to be able to crunch demographics or something, separate that from what your actual identity architecture is. Don't put those things in the database where you're storing your usernames and stuff. Send out a survey later with a secure service, right? So that you're just putting, you can still get that information, but you don't need it to store. So the other thing that we can say is that don't let your, ident don't let your users identify themselves in a way that you know immediately is going to be conflicted. Like if you're gonna set up a political website, hey, how are you, man? Um, so if you're gonna set up a website where you say, okay, there's going to be, it's a political website, should we let people check their political party? If you want deliberation and you want people to come to a discussion and make a decision, my advice is no. Because they're gonna get into the same conflict that they've been and that is holding up Congress as we speak, right? There are existing conflict models that when you let people identify those, you risk like losing the, the conflict that you want. You risk losing the part of the, the conversation that you need by just locking yourself into a conflict model that already exists. On the other hand, conflict is really necessary. And I learned this at, um, actually from Greg Coomer, who works for Valve Software in the gaming industry. And they're really big about like, how much conflict can you have and what sort of conflict can you have. And what they came up with is that it, conflict is really compelling, right? People will participate, it will really help your adoption to have a certain amount of conflict. And conflict really helps productivity. Um, when people get into a conversation, they can see different areas or different parts of the problem because of a conflict, because two people are gonna fight over it, right? So you don't want to eliminate conflict. In terms of user adoption, it's important to keep in mind though that, and I learned this again from Greg Coomer who said, people don't care whether they win or lose. They found this out when they let people play games. If they won really big or they lost really big, they didn't care, they still played because they played for the drama. They played for the fun of it, right? So don't think that you need to set things up to be altogether fair. You want adoption. You, know, you want people to come in and be compelled by your application, but people don't need to win. They need to be heard. And so you can give them a lot of openings to do that. Um, it's important to not get stuck in the same old conflict model, but to give people room to talk. So the way that they manage this in offline communities through the National Coalition of Dialogue and Deliberation is online and offline identifiers. I'm gonna talk about this. The NCDD has this thing that they call um, equality practices, which is they work almost all offline. And basically they're saying that if you get a bunch of people together um, and you want them to discuss schools, for example, and for some reason, you know, there's the bad side of town and the good side of town, then don't hold your meeting about schools at the country club because the people from the bad side of town are gonna get there and you walk through the parking lot. They're this sensitive about it. You're gonna walk through the parking lot and see other people's cars. And it's gonna put people at an advantage, a disadvantage, or give people a bunch of ideas, right? So one of the things they do is that they're very scrupulous about setting the terrain in which you have the conversation. We should think about that when we start designing those little boxes, what is your name? You know, who are you? And why, given what online is, like why do we have the same boxes that the government always asks us for? Because like when we talk about offline, we're talking about things like, you know, how do we recognize people and where, where they're at offline, right? We have all this stuff, we have possessions, um, we have, you know, things like accents and education or like cultural identifiers. And we have political access, whether people are, have access to, you know, like the politarchy somehow, whether they have access to political power, whether they can talk to politicians, no politicians run for office. Lobbyists. Online it's different. Like what have we got to identify people, right? Could be a cat. Um, <laughs> you know, there's a certain amount of status that comes from numbers, you know, when how many followers do they have, how many likes. Um, it's really important to understand that political power online comes from access to code, coders, access to coders, right? 
There's a lot of people that have power in the world, but they don't have power online per se. You know, terrestrial power is a different thing. But you really need, that's one of the reasons why the technocracy is becoming so politically powerful, is not because there's so much of us, but because we actually like rule this world. This is our kingdom. And there's things about design, you know, people who are just really good at like online branding and, and online culture. So those things really work. How are we gonna define an equal space? I love this, this slide because these two things are not equal in size, but they could be equal. It's like, how do you compare an apple with an orange, right? You have to think about what it is. Equality might not be the exact same thing for, every, for both groups. One of the things you need to do is identify the existing conflict model. If you can go do some research, um, you know, that really helps. You should always, if you're going to be writing a political application, uh, meet with offline people, people who are working offline with the community or are hip to the issues. Um, visit the adversaries at home, wherever they are. Like if they're, if they're online, go hang out on their websites, go look at their stuff. If they're offline, like it's coming from a particular neighborhood, coffee shop, region, then go hang out there and see what people are saying on the issues. One of the most important things to understand when you're asking people to come together and make decisions in a community is understanding the difference between good faith and bad faith. If you have people that are working in good faith, then you can have very minimal architecture for handling conflict. You can have very minimal moderators. You can have community moderators. And it doesn't, there's not a he lot of heavy lifting. You can reveal a lot of people's identity and they're not gonna be afraid because they're not gonna be targeted because they all trust each other and like each other, right? That can happen online or offline. But bad faith is where no matter what you do, there's an existing conflict model and this can come through just in terms of vocabulary and stuff that people are going to expose the conflict model and you're gonna get drugged down into some kind of an existing conflict that is already out there in the community. But they need conflict. So one of the focuses that you want to do, or one of the things I think is most productive, is if you can repolarize the conflict. So we've seen a lot of this over the years. Um, one of my favorite ones is like the example of Ducks Unlimited that got environmentalists and hunters together on the same issue. Uh, they both wanted ducks, but one of, one of those groups wanted to kill the ducks. You know, so how do you frame the question? This is huge for the National Coalition on Dialogue and Deliberation. Again, doing offline work, framing is everything. So when you talk about framing a question and you're gonna build an application for a community and you want it to be self-governing, one of the things you can think about on the decision is do we have something that's gonna be goal-oriented? Can we like, just whip out something that is minimally structured with minimal identifiers and it's only gonna be up there for a short amount of time? Or are we trying to create a persistent community of people that are gonna weigh in on their community in a political sense? Because you need more rigorous identifiers here, right? Because people are gonna keep talking to each other. They're gonna keep digging. They're gonna keep trying to expose the differences between themselves. It's well known in a lot of spheres that people make better decisions when they're making decisions based on their own values. But I've seen a couple different tries at getting people to identify themselves. Like again, we go back to that page where you, I, where you get to log in and you have your username and um, how are you gonna identify yourself? And people could, we could put tags on there and we could be like, I'm compassionate. I'm this, I'm that. But all of this vocab vocabulary is wrapped up in existing conflict models in, in, in politics. You know, the vocabulary itself carries a certain burden of the people that are associated with their words, with their memes, with their sound bites. You know, all of that comes into the thing. So one of the things that I think is very important is to allow people to identify their values through a narrative, either through some kind of testimony like tell us a little something about yourself or by having them like go through some kind of a workflow or some kind of a wizard that is going to identify like what do you do with your time? Like I don't wanna know whether you're 
Republican or a Democrat or a Libertarian or anything else. Um, do you go outside? Do you like to volunteer at your kid's school? Do you, um, do you play the stock market? Like, what are your interests? And your interests in a community are your expertise. If you want your community to be self-governing, it's important to realize that time is the critical resource. And one of the problems that we often see when people start talking about self-governing communities is that we're just gonna have everybody vote on everything. It's gonna be like some instant meme kind of stuff. And very quickly you hit voter fatigue. Like nobody wants to weigh in on every single issue. So you're always gonna do some kind of refer to committee or delegation on large issues within your community. And it makes everything faster and cleaner for everybody else. But really, who do you want to be in charge of parks? Who I want to be in charge of parks is, you know, <laughs> the, the hunters because they use the parks, the people in canoes because they use them. Um, who do I want to be in charge of schools? Not necessarily, you know, the businessman, not necessarily the hunter. I want people to be defending and advocating what they, where they spend their time and what they're interested in. And so if you can start breaking up people, and you're still gonna have you're still gonna have arguments between the green team handling the parks and the schools team, right? But that's a different conflict, right? That's kind of a realistic conflict that's surrounded by the resources that we need to allocate. And it's not the same conflict as saying Republican or Democrat, right? That's not a productive conflict. That's an existing conflict that's doing us no good. So we wanna think about solution-based teams. When you allow people to identify themselves, and you assume that you're gonna put people in either short term to make a short decision or long term, you want them to be set up with solution-based teams. Understand something about um, group dynamics and conversational roles. Like one of the things I've really started looking at in terms of my own job is breaking down the different communication strategies of the different software teams I work with. One of the things is that many of the teams have a guy that I call the fast talker. The fast talker, whenever you like throw out a question, will immediately start giving you an answer. Well, I think we should do it this way, right? Um, and then there's the people that I call um, the squirmers. And the squirmers are people that don't even need to like raise their hand. If you work in a team regularly with a guy who's a squirmer, then the first guy says, this is how we should fix it. And the other guy's like, Mrr. And then you have somebody else who will like call him out and be like, what do you mean by that? <laughs> you know, this happens, I think there's several teams where I've seen this happen, right? And the squirmer can have just as much power as the fast talker in a well-developed team, right? Where they recognize each other. But understanding these, these conversational roles that it's like, okay, we've got a fast talker, we've got a squirmer. And then someplace also you have like a guy who sums everything up and puts things into order. Um, I have several people like this, like kind of in my thing, where they basically take other, other people's information and iterate it back and organize it. They are often like administrators. At the end, they'll be like, well, okay, so what we really should do is blah, 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 blah. And somehow they fit together the squirmer and the other guy, and they do that. It's important to understand, again, that you're not going to make big decisions en masse. Um, you're going to have consultations, delegations, and... Um, referrals to committees, and make sure that you just have an ongoing communication plan, not just between members of the team, but between different teams, so that they all can kind of, the more, the more you're iterating when people are trying to make a decision in a community, the better off you're gonna be. Briefly, I'm gonna talk about um, linguistic stuff. <sighs> An idiolect is your own speech. You have a dialect that only you speak, or a, a language that only you speak, that you learn from your parents and from your friends, and you pick up just your own words and things that you, that you read or whatever. That is your idiolect. Dialect comes from interacting with other people. And the final thing is an evolved vocabulary. This is one of the things that makes NLP not really work for assembling people for deliberation. The way that it essentially works is that um, users, as users get together and they decide that they're gonna have a conversation and they're gonna make a decision, 
they redefine the words. There's something called semantic drift. And the, as we start making a conversation and we talk to each other, one of the things, especially in decision making, is that we start deciding like exactly what we mean by that. And communities will get semantic drift in the craziest ways. Like if you ever see FARC, they have the Florida tag. Like if you were gonna do NLP and be like, what does the Florida tag mean? It's not gonna give you the meaning that it means to a bunch of Farkers, right? Um, and that happens with everything. I mean, in my job, we have bacon, you know? People are just like, bacon, in the middle of nowhere. And if we were just gonna crunch it and try and figure out like, what are the important words and what defines what in the community? And you had to just put a definition on that. And you're like, well, bacon is kind of meat. And, and it's not, <laughs> why is the vegan shouting it all the time? Um, <laughs> so one of the things I've been thinking about a lot in terms of, of linguistic stuff is allowing users to tag their stuff, hashtags is, is totally reasonable, and define the content with their own vocabulary. When you are building an identity architecture for a group that you want to be self-governing, like, then you don't, ideally, you wouldn't even be giving them guidance into how they define themselves or the language that they're using. Now, like I said, like FARC has the Florida tag and we have some great examples of like cool tagging schemes slash dot, you know, where people can say like, oh, this is interesting or this is something else and they have a certain number of tags. One way to talk about this um, on a larger scale is push tags, which is to say that when somebody puts something in the system, like they're making a comment um, or starting a thread, uh, they can tag it and you want to give them options of tags that are already appreciated by the community or things that besides things that they could invent themselves right so it'd be nice to have like a word cloud there and be like these are our most popular tags and then you can like tag something there right so then the next thing is is that I would like to see a push tag is what I call when a comment comes up then users have the tags on the bottom the tags that it's already been tagged with by the guy who launched it. And if a user hits the tag again, then the tag rises, right? And the reputation of the tag, tell some of you have been thinking about this already. So the reputation of the tag eventually is allowing the community to self-define their vocabulary. Let users define other users, role tags and popular privileges. So one of the things I also was goofing around with a couple years ago, um, is the idea of conversational roles as reputation. Like, can you tag somebody with, um, with not just up or down or good or bad, but like the kind of role that they play? Like, could you say, like, this guy is a squirmer <laughs> in the conversation, this guy is a fast talker? And we know something useful about him by saying, like, he's a fast talker or a squirmer. I'm not sure what a squirmer would be online. But you get some useful information by saying, okay, this is, and you know that you're never gonna have a team full of fast talkers. That team fails. And it, sometimes it either fails or somebody who was a fast talker turns into something else. Like those conversational roles evolve within any given group. But I'm really interested in understanding like the roles in a community because what that means is in some cases where a group, for example, a lot of people are talking and they're having a hard time getting to that summation can you call in that, that wise man who is good at summing things up? If you're dealing with a bunch of people, another popular role that we see all the time is the wonk. Like, say we all go out to dinner. It's like, let's have Mike order the wine, because he knows all about wine. Oh, that reminds me, I've got to explain the wine on the prior slide. Um, <laughs> so let's have him do the wine, because he knows all about wine, right? And you regularly delegate to people in your communities this way. This is just part of like our regular life, is that you delegate some of your stuff to people who know it. But wouldn't it be useful like when you get into a conversation, people get into a conversation, they're trying to make a decision, if they could call the wonk. They could hit a button and be like, I want a wonk here. And somebody else had been like on another thread had been like, this guy's a wonk, this guy's a wonk, right? If somebody had been tagging the guy with wonkness on different topics, and then you could call that guy and pull him, what I really need is like a water wonk, right? Pull him into the conversation. Several other roles that are really obvious to me are um, ambassadors, people who are members of multiple communities and can, and can work well with different communities. Um, another one is firemen. Like anybody who can put out a flame war. You wanna be, can you imagine like how beautiful it would be on a forum if you could just call the firemen? Um, 
so another thing I gotta say, I don't know if any of you watched um, Jezebel like roll out their new comment system like a few years ago, probably three years ago now. They had a really cool thing where it's like, just if nobody commented on it, when somebody start, tried to start a flame war and was some, when somebody was trolling, they were like, don't feed the trolls. And they had a really aggressive system for like syncing stuff. You know, if it didn't get, it didn't have to be flagged, but everybody would upvote the positive stuff and it just naturally sank. So um, I really liked the way that that worked and their community just got it like right off the bat and it worked really well. I do think there's places where you should be able to sync stuff, flag stuff, or make it um, less accessible. The other thing I've played around with is like negative roles. When somebody's a chicken little or tagging arguments with rhetoric, there you go again with the straw man stuff. Finally, I want to talk to you about, in this section, like one of the most, um, one of the thorniest problems in deliberation, which if you're building applications where people are gonna discuss things and try and come to a decision. Like we know that discussions are trees. You can look, see it on Reddit or Slashdot, even Facebook where you have a branch and then you have a bunch of comments and then somebody can branch, can make a comment on a comment and then they go down and we're looking at a tree, right? So, a lot of applications have that. The critical problem is that your conversation is essentially just gonna diverge, right? It's gonna become threads and expand and expand and maybe you can prune and say like, okay, this thread is done. But eventually, like people get exhausted on the conversation and at what point do they, they're within their own group, their thread runs out and they might, there might be people still interested in the decision but the real thing would be is if you could throw them together with a new group of people who are equally committed, but you can't figure out what their content is because we can't just go for the keywords, right? We don't really know what they're talking about because they have evolved separate vocabularies and it's very hard to tie this together. This would be really obvious if we had online conversations with millions of users trying to make political decisions. You know, they'd be like off in left field with evolved vocabularies in small groups. So at some point, there's the prompt to merge, which is like to say, when a thread dies out, where, let's say that the thread hasn't seen any action in 30 days, and we want those people to come to a decision. We need them to make a decision. Like the budget has gotta be passed by this date, right? You can't just like throw your hands up in the air because the government is waiting on you. So um, when that comes out, how are we gonna like get them in? And I think like one of the ways that you could look at it is to do some statistical analysis, but really there should be a choice for the users. Like, do you want to, these are some threads that appear to be like your thread. Which one of these, you're gonna be merged. Nobody's talking on your thing anymore. You haven't come to a decision. Where do you wanna go? Which one of these is the thread you wanna join? And prompt to merge, I think, and how you wanna handle that as an algorithm. I've looked at a lot of, I've looked at a lot of statistical tools for suggestion recently. Um, and phrases of keywords, not just like single words, but phrases. Um, and, but above all, then you have to leverage the user. I think that it's like, I, it would be very hard to automate that and do it authentically and happily for your users. There might be a thread that doesn't seem at all related to you and might be just tangential or orthogonal, but the users might love it, right? They might, that's really what they were trying to talk about. That's really the decision they wanted to make. Finally, because I wrote an algorithm for Robert's Rules of Order when I was in school, I wanna just like point out one of the nice things about like looking at Robert's Rules of Order, which is that thing where it's like make a motion, second the motion, it's used in city councils all the time. It's a pain, um, but it was originally designed for scalable groups working in bad faith. And so it's a book of rules like this, it's horrible, right? But all deliberation that I've found is essentially a subset of what Charles, or what is it, Robert Henry Martin wrote over 30 years. It was a 30 year opus for him to like meet with political groups in towns where they were trying to manage themselves, right? And people would just give him suggestions and he kept adding it to the book. And so he really had a lot of time on the ground and he's got a solid work um, of like deliberative rules. The most important of these I think are like limits of debate. Um, the obvious thing 
is you know, either let people talk for only a short amount of time or make your text box with a character count. Don't allow direct replies. Direct replies will start conflicts. You know, if you can like, let people just make their statement, and especially if you limit the number of times that people can testify on any given subject. People will have their ducks in a row if you only let them talk twice, right? That's what the standard is, is in a city council meeting. You can testify twice and you have to wait your turn. You cannot directly reply to somebody else. Those are very useful if you're working with a group in bad faith. For moderation, you know, you can have a community uh, manager or a chairman, community managers from the community itself is a very good idea. Um, so Robert's Rules of Order actually has a provision where um, the chairman can like throw somebody out if they're disruptive in a meeting and if they're gonna hold up the, the decision. Because again, you gotta come to a decision in government. Um, I would like to see a system where the, the citizens themselves can throw people out. I think that that's like, you know, can you hold a vote to, to shun someone? You know, I mean, maybe they can come back later but I, that's one thing that Robert's Rules of Order doesn't have, is like, I make a motion to like kick him out, because he's like making noise and causing trouble. Especially if some, you have an, Ill, an individual that's trying to like essentially filibuster. And Robert's Rules of Order does not have a, pro, a provision for filibustering, and it's something that I really don't like. I don't like it when people filibuster, they're holding up the whole group. There could be reasons where it's like a good thing or a bad thing, but I don't support it. <laughs> Okay, questions? We're through the first part. Go ahead. Yeah, so. Yeah, so I'm actually gonna pick that up. This is a parking lot question because I'm gonna pick that up in the next section the next place that I'm talking, um, particularly about some of the issues and problems, but the benefits, you know, also of like external, external authentication systems. Anybody else? Go ahead. So I, I like the idea of just drawing the distinction between good faith you know, and, and bad faith. Bad it's critical. But I think a lot of communities exhibit sort of a spectrum along there. Right? <laughs> or they so start like, in good faith and they go to bad faith, faith. or the other way. Yeah, totally. Yeah. There are certain trigger topics mm -hmm. or actors or whatever that sort of pull it the other direction. So I, I'm kind of interested, maybe this is too vague, but I'm interested in what, what are the sort of dynamic systems that handle like detecting and correcting for that shift? Yeah. In that kind of community that's more focused on good faith sort of collaboration and, and deliberation. And, and, but you can see the situations where they start sliding over to bad faith. How do you. So the infrastructure, yeah, so the infrastructure architect in me is going to say that. Um, you manage you manage that part of your. I would start. I would start depending if you thought it was in good faith or you thought it was in bad faith. If you were working in bad faith, then you know you're going to have a bunch of rules. Start with a bunch of rules, and if they seem to be going along fine, see if you can pull some out. Um, if you're working in good faith, like have very few rules, and if it's not being, then suggest to your community, can we lock this down? You know, this is taking too long. And again, I, have, I keep saying this, but it's like time is the resource. Time is the resource. You will lose your users, you will lose your decision if you keep people in it for too long. On the other hand, as long as everybody gets heard, they don't have to win. And nobody loves anything better than getting the decision done, you know? Because these things just become an ordeal when, you know, I mean, jury duty, for example, can really be difficult trying to get a jury to all come together. I, I guess I would just say that Starting from good faith and moving over, maybe the trap is some of the types of conversations that can split, flip the bit for people and put them into bad faith sort of mode are discussions about rules, right? You know, yeah, yeah, for sure. Moderation rules for sure. So this right? is and why. The whole community just sort of went in evil hair on fire mode. Not the whole community, yeah. but a certain portion went in evil hair on fire So the way that. The yeah. So what I would say about that is, for one thing, I. Um, I'm very specific about being, this is not a free for all, this is a deliberation. We're trying to come to a decision. And so that is also why I kind of threw um, Robert's Rules of Orders out there. You're not on your own. Like NCDD has like an entire like resource section with a gajillion 
um, articles on like different kinds of methodologies for groups trying to make decisions and work together. And they work with some really gnarly conflicts, you know? Um, so it's worth it to think about, to, to say that it's like, I'm not just imposing these rules. You could also let people vote on it, you know? Can, should we impose more rules? You know, but I would definitely set up structures from the beginning, dealing with time as a resource, being like, we're going to come to a decision within a week, 30 days, 30 minutes. I've even like thought a lot recently about speed deliberation apps. Like, can you get people to like agree on what to put on a pizza in five minutes? You know, um, because speed deliberation is really cool if you've worked with experienced deliberationists. They're just like they're really, really fast. So they have to learn it. They have to practice it. But formal deliberation has a place online in understanding the rules. And I would use external resources and be like, this, this is kind of the basis of our algorithm. Are these rules from Robert's Rules of Order? These are the limits of debate. And if we cannot stick by this, we're going to have to introduce more rules. You could let your community choose the rules they want to and give them some choices there. Or you could let your community like deliberate on how they want to deliberate. right? But you definitely need to be able to lock it down. Yeah. Uh, where the thesis is that I'm um, down with that. The, <laughs> you can the comment. The United States legislature were designed to be uh, a more deliberative body. Yeah. Where where it focuses on discussion and individuals coming to the floor. But most uh, parliamentary democracies worldwide are designed to be representational. Whatever party yeah. has the most votes yeah. goes ahead. So we have all these structures to encourage deliberation. And the authors of the book, the thesis is that Yeah. Um, even though all the structure still existed for a deliberative body. So yeah. That gives them lots of tools to hold things up. Yeah. Because the idea was that they were supposed to discuss the things in good faith. Whereas if they were in the, in the UK parliament, whoever had the majority would just get all their laws. Yeah. Um, although, so although there's the a, UK parliament is representational, it's a whole other thing. That yeah. So, I mean. One of the things that I, I like really, when I look at this stuff like with somebody with like deli my deliberative engineer eyes, when I go and like look at conflicts, one of the things that becomes very obvious in politics is that they profit from conflict, right? They profit from conflict. They'll like stir up conflicts just so that they can like do a fundraising um, haul so that they can like make a bunch of like, you know, fear mongering is a great way to get votes even. And so uh, as citizens, if we want to be, if you want to make a community that's self-governing, in some ways you have to like get, you have to create some kind of a system where you're not rewarding people for conflict mongering. I mean, one of the other thoughts I had about having a tag is being able to sink someone if they're partisan in a political, um, like as soon as they mention the name of a politician, it's like you flag it and send them to the bottom. <laughs> you know, if you're not talking about an election, don't bring up a politician. You know, like something like that, where you're punishing people for bringing those things in. So, just to preface, uh, I happen to have been spending the last few years building what's basically an online democracy in the form of a, a democracy they call it a co op. I've got a bunch mm -hmm. of thoughts, and so I'm going to try to focus and not say all of the stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, uh, they're when horrible. The, when you look at the co-op movement, mm -hmm. and you look at a lot of other types of organizations that uh, have dealt with these types of things for a long time, you end up with working at, um, more like facilitation. Yeah. The, the word that you, that you hit, seem to hit that, but you didn't say a lot, was facilitator. Yeah. So that's the word that I think most people use, and it's almost to the level of, like, I like to talk a lot, and I would even like it to be not even you and me who both have opinions and things we want to say, yeah. but somebody else who is the volunteer here who would say, you know, okay, let me answer your question. So um, I'm, I work specifically with deliberation that's decision-making de deliberation, but there's another kind called exploratory deliberations, and they use facilitators. So one of the differences between those things is that a facilitator, an exploratory deliberation, we'll actually go into this like off-channel someplace, 
But um, exploratory deliberations are great for small groups where they just need to understand each other's languages. Uh, as you scale up, the more people you have involved, the less conversation you can have. And the less you're doing that thing where it's like, the thing about Robert's Rules of Order is that it's, a lot of it is almost, it's, it's ternary, it's not binary, but people can be like, yes, no, abstain. And then they have to talk to each other and facilitate it. So it is made for scalability and bad faith. And you might be able to pull off, I, I mean, most of the things that I see nowadays, in fact, are using facilitators. And NCDD is all about facilitation. But scalability, in turn, and this is the infrastructure engineer with me again, you need a DevOps engineer. You don't need a sysadmin. You need to be able to like automate facilitation. So, so there's tons of challenges building this into an online system. Yeah. But I just, there's a general point that I seem, I'm basically convinced about, mm -hmm. that a huge portion of even the say, the problems in the US Congress are actually caused by Robert's rules. Like they actually impose a situation in which they make people take sides, they make people take positions. If the, the rules themselves actually. They have iteration the on it, though. So that's, I mean, again, you have people that already have sides. It's in bad faith. Yeah, but so yeah. it's like, I, again, like there's, you can, a good way to do it is to stage an, explore, an exploratory deliberation so that people, you can build a parent consensus. This was the talk I gave last time I'm here. Let me pick this up with okay. you the next time um, so that I can go ahead. So one specific other question, though, that's related mm -hmm. to all this. Uh, you have thoughts about the, the, you're talking about online infrastructure, all of this. The place that I'm most aware of that's most robust is Wikipedia. Yeah, so and they're a great community for like. How they work in terms of these things you just talked about? I haven't spent enough time in that community, but I have talked to some of their members. And of course, they're fascinated with this topic. When we talk about like who could become the next virtual, like the first like real virtual democracy with political power, it's like Wikipedia is like a, a good one. Yeah. OK. Um, so one of the things, I'm, I'm in this, the part now where I talk about good enough voter verification. And one of the things, a few years ago, I was part of a group. Um, it was a national um, online group where we called the Online Dialogue and Deliberation Infrastructure Group. And they were particularly concerned with identity architecture. And their idea was that they would put up a database and they would secure it and it would be like everybody could just put their data in it and they would run like a nonprofit and people would be able to have one kind of authentication, like single sign in for like all kinds of political applications that actually held their political information. Well, that's really expensive to maintain and it's holding a lot of personal information. It's interesting that right now I'm working in the government space because I work for Socrata. And I think one of the interesting things is, is that government owns identity. So you don't have to, government has no qualms about asking you for your social security number, right? They own it, or your driver's license. Like, should you give that to the government? They have it, right? So you're not giving it to somebody who already, they, they could use it against you. It's like government owns that. But there's problems with that too, because it's like if you want to bring up some kind of a, a an argument with your government, if you want to protest your government, or if you want to critique your government, then you don't necessarily want to be tied to the identity that they own. Everything I have been working on in terms of um, identity architecture and security focuses on like access and audibility. So if it can be audited, it doesn't necessarily need to be unforgeable. Like your social security card is a piece of paper. Like anybody can make that. Anybody could make a decent reproduction, right? I mean, maybe it has special paper, but they're not checking the paper when they look at it, right? And so it just has to be auditable on some level. Like they have to be able to check it back and be like, there's just one source. Um, the people that are gonna have access to, um, the people that, that need these features are like the citizenry, the citizenry themselves, contributors to the political system, whether they're citizens or not. And you know, critics in particular need a certain amount of protection. Problem with single sign-on is my screenshot from the NSA. Um, so, you know, there is the issue that it's, it's like if you're not paying for a service, you're selling yourself, right? You're selling your data for free services. The problem I have with single sign-ons, though, beyond that, and that is a problem, is that it's never really clear to me. Like, they have to get a bunch of permissions in most frameworks when you download a mobile app. It's not clear which of those permissions they're actually using and which they're not. 
Um, the other thing I don't like is that when you get multiple single sign-on like kind of stuff going on where it's like, I'm just gonna use my Google thing and then, uh, and this happened here at Open Source Bridge where like they supported Google and then they didn't support, I, at one point, and I have like authentication adventures all the time. And like <laughs> at one point, it's like my, I had like three different accounts with Open Source Bridge at least. And I like finally was, cause I couldn't remember which one I signed on in, in the first place. They kept making new ones, I couldn't tell. I have many names anyway. I finally like just started emailing their system and being like, can you fix that? And he merged them all into once. But you know, that's still pretty goofy. So we have these questions about when you're asking people to give you, when you're, when you're building an identity architecture, you're asking people to give you their data. Who owns the data? Do you own the data? Are you selling the data? Are, where is the data? Is it hosted on somebody else's server? Where is it? How do you defend the data? Like how secure is your security? And what's the business plan? And how does it influence access? Like this comes up like if you're asking people to like pay to sign in, um, if you're having subscription services, or if you're using like mobile devices with like limited, where some people, not everybody has a mobile device. Some options for external verification. This is to say that we're, if we wanna define like kind of where people are or who people are without using um, a government ID, then we could be, we can just allow them to self-define. That's perfectly acceptable in a lot of cases. If you're building advisory applications, like the number of people who would forge like on some obscure forum about school safety might not be a lot, you know? So you have, it's always about fit. Like there's, this may not be a problem in your community. Um, you can use social networks, but you know, there's those issues. You're basically selling people's data to the social network in a lot of cases. You could use financial information, which is very solid. Again, this is how I originally started thinking about PayPal, is that it has a barrier of entry for access. Like not everybody's gonna use PayPal, but a lot of people do. And so, and financial information is solidly verifiable in terms of like, it's important to say like, it's at this address. They do this all the time. Like different businesses do this to you all the time. We don't use it much in, in political applications. And geolocation, like you can just grab people where they are. I don't like, I, I don't think that you should be telling your government all the time where you are. I also think your government probably shouldn't have your DNA. There's like, those are just, they don't need it necessarily. So one of the things to dig a little deeper on financial information, um, because this is what I came up with after going away from ODDI, is that I wanted something that could be like lightweight authentication that would still give politicians like a solid, um, a solid definition that people are who they say they are. That they, when they're, the difference between, um, politicians don't care what people think, right? They care what citizens think. And you wanna like nail somebody down to a voter profile and say, are they voters? Because that's where the rubber hits the road. And that was the problem that we were trying to solve. So PayPal does address verification for free if you have a PayPal account, or you can like sell them a, a dollar, make a dollar sale, and somebody's gotta like track it back to a credit card or a real address. Um, there are a bunch of different existing, not just PayPal, but other kinds of verification systems based on financial information. PayPal actually does strategies where that you can use, um, you can use like Google, you can use Facebook, and you can do something else. And so hooking this up to the PayPal API is one thing. So the, the thing that would make it valid in terms of voters is to say that we could take your logging information with, pay, with PayPal, this is my name, this is my address, or whatever you're gonna get, and cross it with the Washington State voter, voter database. I live in Washington, but many states have publicly accessible voter databases. And what I would do at that point, where Jeff and I have been going with this, is that you make, you make a match. Somebody can say, okay, this is, this is what I want my username to be. This is how I want you to contact me via my email or whatever my thing is. And then you're gonna make the PayPal sale. You're gonna regex their name or do whatever you have to do to try and like match it to an identity within the Washington State data voter base. It's interesting that you can get an 80%, this has come up with a friend of mine who's an analyst. In terms, you can get an 80% match if you know somebody's gender, where they live, and their age. 
Like you don't even need their name, right? It's like that tight. Um, obviously in high density areas, this is not gonna be as accurate, but really in terms of identifying someone, you, if you have a name and you have, you know, like their address down to like their credit card and you match that, then you have probably got pretty solid authentication that this person is the voter they say they are. And then, and I would hold all that in memory, the way that I've been coding this so far is that you hold it all in memory and dump it. Once you've got the verification, you triple flag that says, this is this person, this is their username, and this is their voter, this is their voting district, this is where they are. But you don't have to give their address, you don't have to give their age, you don't have to give any personal information, don't even store that in your database, right? Because what you wanna show the politician is that this is a voter, and you've authenticated that. Now this means that people would have to like pay a dollar a year to reauthenticate, or every couple years or something, because they will move, they will change, and it's not like universal. But in a lot of situations that I was looking at, where people were specifically interested in um, voter verification, this was good enough. And this was a lot cheaper and easier for anybody to pull off than trying to have a database in the sky. So yeah. Um, it's not because the you're not. Um, so there's restrictions on the Washington State data voter database. It can only be used like for nonprofit political stuff, right? You can't like just do anything with it. Um, the hmm. They're not enforced, it's true. I, the first thing that my friend Jeff did was like look up the astrological signs of all of his neighbors. Um, <laughs> and he's still like everybody on his street. I'm like, what's with that house? And he's like, the guy's a Pisces. Um, so, <laughs> you know, yeah, it's not enforced. But it's very interesting. It's actually very interesting that that's out there and a lot of people don't realize it. Now, I'm not in the ins and outs with it in terms of like, but you don't have to charge right cuz paypal will verify without a charge and there are different ways to like get the information um, you could also maybe make the money go to something that was like you could sell a nonprofit sure. kind yeah, of stuff just, sell know, a contribution there's the sort of like dogmatic aspect of pull tax and then there's the sort of accessibility aspect right yeah uh, the ability to pay a dollar online is actually an accessibility it is, I, and, 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 and that's why it's good enough. I'm not saying this is a good solution. Okay. I'm just saying that in certain communities, and it's all about fit, this is good enough. And this is a lot more accessible than anything that I've seen in terms of people trying to put a big database in the sky and asking for a social security number for people and storing social security numbers. Like, I see this stuff regularly. Don't do that. Don't be holding that data. You know, that's a threat. Like, the, even if nobody else has the information, like you're talking about people who are critical of government, you should not be holding their information because they can become victims of their government. A lot of electronic de democracy is not focused on the United States. It's focused on things where democracy is terrorism. Um, and so I'm very protective of critics, you know? So financial information, I recently wrote an article on um, best practices for participatory budgeting um, applications that's gonna come out in September. Um, but when I was doing interviews for that, Ari Hoffman of Socrata, who was with the Comptroller's Office in New York City, in fact, they did this. Um, they did this with campaign contributions because they already had the money, right? Somebody had already given them a credit card or some kind of financial identifier. And they weren't using it for citizens. They didn't care about voters. They were interested in residents and taxpayers. Um, and they just wanted to identify like whether somebody was in the borough or something where they were. And so they used this and they disclosed to people that they were doing it. Um, they just needed to know, you know who was paying the taxes and who was making contributions and stuff. And he said to me, like, oh, it's no risk. These are purely advisory applications. So like, if we get down in the, if we start rat holing ourselves, and this came up again and again in that talk, if we start rat holing ourselves in, in identity, then to a point where people aren't using the applications, um, we're, we're missing the boat. Online and offline initiatives are really big in participatory budgeting, and there's different ways to go about this. Um, 
there's, you could have people show up at a town hall meeting or something and then like download a code and have access to some kind of a thing there. Um, some other companies are actually using devices on site. So you get together with a group of people and everybody puts their answers into, um, into a laptop and then you like upload the data together from there. So there's some stuff like that where identity architecture is kind of moot because they're all there together in a room anyway. Questions? Go ahead. Yeah. Is there a similar system where you can do that where you can essentially keep things in temporary cache for, uh, for verification and then just have to verify the flag? So I've got a parking lot back because I'm about to go into like mobile devices and the pros and cons of that. Um, no, it's not. It's good. It's good. It's good that you're asking that because that is the natural next thing. So there's always a penalty for access. Like this was one thing that when I first got into electronic democracy, then there's a bunch of people that are walking around being like, it's not really democratic if there's a penalty for access. And right now we punish people the way we make them register to vote. It's horrible, you know. And it, and there's always a penalty for access, you know. And it's just if you're going to be good about it. The fact is that most of us are not building like national applications. You're building something for a specific community. Pick access that works for your community. Let me, you had a question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. 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 They put too much of their identity on that. Uh -huh. So it's really like we've had a very, very difficult time of trying to find the balance between letting people expose enough of their identity that we can hold them accountable, but at the yeah. same time allow real debate and deliberation to happen where people aren't just scared away. Because yeah. And can you have something where you can actually go to a politician and jerk their chain and be like, like these really are your voters. These really are people that care about it. And there's a certain amount of influence in that. And uh, some of the work that I've been doing in the last like year was mental health advocacy. I was a speaker for NARPO, which is the National Association for Rights and Patient Advocacy, which is like half lawyers and half like people from the patient survivor network, meaning people who have survived mental institutions. And it was just a super intense group. But you know, people who have been in mental institutions are you know victimized because of their records all the time. And it's just really important to to have. Um, authentication that I think that we should be able to communicate. You need, in certain cases, especially on touchy issues, you need ways to communicate your, with your government where you can say, I am authentic, but you're not going to tell your government which authentic person you really are. I think there's really a place for this. Go ahead, sir. So I'm uh, in the situation of currently building within the US government a single sign on. Yeah. Keeping it very safe. Yeah. Because it's, you know, trying to keep it away from bad actors, wherever those bad actors may be. Yeah. Such as within our own organization, like we're naming no names. Um, but. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a screenshot earlier, but go on. <laughs> uh, one of the interesting things, though, is the, the take issue with this is the idea that, like, government owns your identity. Because most of the government identity systems that we use for, like, hard, we do very light work, LOA 1. So mm -hmm. Yeah, right? yeah. It's actually quite a confusing from a user experience point of view. Yeah, it is. In, in the UK, for example, where, where people tend to be, you know, it tends to be the government has all the information. Yeah. And then they go through and suddenly get forwarded out to Equifax. Yeah. <laughs> I, my favorite on this is like I get my certs from Global Sign, and yet when Global Sign wants to do anti-phishing, they send you to a third party, and so and so you and then you're just like, wait, you are phishing. Wait, are you phishing? They actually have like a Hotmail address or something wherever they're sending you, and we saw this thing and we were like, ah, but it was legit and it was like a third party thing. Yeah, you had a question. Um, so I, was, um, I just finished a job launch right now. Uh huh. Yeah, for sure. 
Yeah. It's a different thing. Yeah. So it's it's hard. So the hardest thing always is like, how are you going to scale it? Because if you work with a community that you know well and very closely, then you can give them a sign, single sign-on option that is very practical. You could be like, all of us use Facebook, and it's no problem to share our Facebook with the job. Um, I don't know what job that is, but it might, it might be out there. Um, but it's like as you get bigger and bigger, as you get more users and users that are not necessarily all on the same page, um, then that becomes like more of an issue. And setting defaults and practical defaults, like one of the things I just say is that it's really nice if you can always just have the most basic authentication is like a username and email or something and store, you know, without getting any more details, like always have just, you know, a custom sign on and just don't rely on other services completely. Okay, go ahead. Oh, um, yeah. The fact that they use their SSA uh, to verify that you're actually um, eligible for financial aid, um, it's not as if they can authenticate most of the people who, who are asking for financial aid for things like for things like financial records. Uh -huh. A lot of these people are, don't have financial yeah, records yet. Yeah. Um, yeah. But at the same time, they're asking to verify their SSA, and then depending on how old the student is, their parents' SSA. Yeah. Um, as well as if they're a scholar. And, yeah. Um, So that is too tricky a question for me in some ways. I want to pick that conversation with you off channel because um, it's kind of a, um, when you start talking about how are we going to authenticate to government, specifically in our relationships with government, it's like it's much more fraught with peril. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next thing just so that we can do this. Is, so this is where we get into like the, this is like a really kind of wonky thing that just started showing up um, out of discussions in the last six months at my company, like how would we make completely, I completely um, government independent identity, and that's important to the idea of sovereignty. Because if you think about it, like um, if we send an ambassador to France, we don't necessarily give them a bunch of information about our ambassador. They get his passport, and they got to believe that he's the guy we say he is. And that's why you can send CIA there, or whatever, right? Um, a, to have a certain amount of sovereignty, it means that a government authenticates and holds their authentication without third party, or that they can completely control the third party, which you know, is what some governments do. Um, but so you're talking about that, right? Problems with sovereignty and online identifiers. Like somebody owns those banks, so your information could be like tampered with, your financial information could be tampered with by somebody within the system. Somebody owns the servers. A sysadmin could always tamper with it or mess with it. Somebody owns your driver's license. Again, like technically that's like property of the state. They can revoke it if they want. The internet is bugged. We know that. Um, all kinds of things are going on there. And in terms of hardware, there's like the MAC address on your actual device, right? So you're tied to your device in a lot of cases when you're networking and when you're communicating with different things. This kid is named Giacomo Ferrari, and he went to this great museum um, in Seattle, and it's like a computer history museum where they actually have old computers. And he came back with this a punch card, you know? So we're sitting around the kitchen talking about, we were, and we're all like, oh, I wonder what it says. And another guy came up named Mark Slumko, which is who the slum key is named after. This is Mark photobombing Mark. He's a great developer. And he was like, there ought to be like a thing where you could have two of these and two people could meet and they could put them together and then they, you, they would have another thing. You know, just like any kind of key encryption essentially is what you have. Like, so why is this useful? Well, I was working on an application a couple years ago that never really made it out of the design phase. But one of the things we wanted people to do is that they could, um, they could list a protest and people could go to the protest and check in with a mobile phone. 
And why this would be useful is that one of the ways that they um, dictate this, the, or talk about the success of a protest is that there were like millions of people at the protest, or 100 people at the protest. How many people were protesting? And so if you could authenticate the number of people that were actually at the protest, like would that be some kind of a valuable thing? Um, sometimes they do these big pictures, you know, and then they count the people in the square or whatever. And be, but you know, most protests are small. And there's something to be said for people being like, I showed up again and again at this protest. But then you have that access barrier. And I got called out on this a lot because I was in college. And they were like, I don't have a smartphone. I don't want a smartphone. So I was like really looking for some way to make it so that people could show up and use somebody else's phone to authenticate, right? Like, could they print out like a one-time QR code or something and like scan it and be like, I was here and so was so-and-so, right? And the reason that this concept, and when Mark showed up with this, then whether this is, whether this is a punch card or whether it's just some kind of, uh, of a key that you could put with another key, it's like a physical object that's not attached to any hardware. You generate it once, you make sure that it's disposable, and then this somehow can allow a digital authentication. So it's a machine-generated physical artifact for peer authentication. And you're being authenticated by somebody you meet in the real world, right, offline. And it kind of suggests that you could have agnostic devices, that people could show up and use any device. It wouldn't even have to be the device of the other person, right? You could have a device totally under, you borrow somebody's phone off the street. Um, I like the idea that you could be disposable and that it could be encrypted. A lot of the same stuff that goes along, and you can make this, again, it doesn't have to be a punch, it would be ridiculous to make it a punch card. So um, you could do it, again, with um, barcodes, QR codes, people who want to go completely digital and like deal with the keys thing and do some kind of peer authentication have talked to me about the Bluetooth where you like bump the phones, um, doing keys that way. And there's some cool stuff that goes where you can say, okay, each person in my community can only authenticate one other person, like it's chaining. And that way, they only ever hold the identity of one other person, and they, only one other person ever knows their identity. Or you could have super peers, like people who will authenticate all over the place, right? Or you could have some kind of super peer devices, like a third party device, a gateway of some, of some sort where people could come in. I think that this has implications for immigration issues in virtual democracies, right? Where we start to talk about passports, because you're building something that could be created, could be generated, and you can say for sure that there was a person associated with it or there was an action, or reasonably you could say that there was an action associated with it, but it is not traceable the way, um, you can't really say much else. You can't say that it's like there's financial information, there's voter information. This is just like a, for a group of people that are being like, yeah, there's people here, right? We started talking a lot about disposable identifiers, um, like the ability to like make a, make a passport that you could just be like, use it to get in. Like if you wanted somebody from a physical nation to treat with a virtual nation, then do they need a permanent passport? Or could you just like let somebody in and then poof, like get rid of their passport somehow? Um, so I like the idea of doing this somehow, and we've messed around, we've, this has just been a big brainstorm among a bunch of people about no artifacts. Jeff, again, <laughs> my muse, Jeff, is like, I want it to be 3D printed and edible. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, so there's this cool idea is that it's like the thing should, could the thing be made so that it can somehow produce the energy or carry the energy that it needs for its own decryption? And um, we started talking about flash paper encoding in part because of this like totally cool video, which I can't play because I'm using a stupid PowerPoint. However, this will go up someplace. This guy um, is burning a piece of flash paper and using an optical sensor. And what he did is cut teeth out of the flash paper. And so parts of the flash paper were wider. And then when he burned it, there were like parts where it was like the flash paper was bigger. And so it made bumps on the optical sensor. Now, I think this, we loved this idea, like the flash slim key, right? <laughs> um, the thing about this that is maybe like a little bit impractical is that I don't like optical sensors. Um, I would like to see something that was like a contact sensor of some sort or an audio sensor. Like, can you put like a wire 
in a laminated piece of paper and burn the paper and just plug the wire into the computer and then the paper's gone and then there's a digital signature that goes up, right? There's a lot that we could mess around with in terms of understanding um, what the implications of this are, like physical keys that are identifying people in online communities and that are completely off the record in terms of actual governments and third party things. Okay, questions? I think I'll hear first. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, just a quick technical question. So, so the uh, simple device to kill has taken um, The Fido U2S mode, there, so without the Fido. Oh, yeah, 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 um, yes. Is that like a fob, like what we use for like um, MFA? Um, you can use it, I mean, this is a second factor. Uh -huh. So I have this, like, yeah. one of the great things is Chrome, all versions of Chrome use this right now without Chrome. Uh -huh. So you can just basically plug this in after typing your password, tap it, and, it uh -huh. and, the, and the system they've come up with is really nice in terms of uh, privacy and makes it incredibly simple. Yeah. Um, Two factor. Uh, yeah. Device, yeah. Device, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I think, again, we come down, like, obviously, we've gone down, in my job, we've gone down the rat hole and trying to make things that are, like, totally disposable um, on this. And there's reasons for that. Part of it is that it's just, like, a really fun thought experiment. Um, but you could obviously have different kinds of, like, physical ideas, like, create your own IDs and verify people, have peer authentication with people that through some other kind of a thing. Okay, go ahead. Um, so this is kind of tangential, but just like sort of topical, just little tiny comment, just to be mm -hmm. smart. Uh, there's a startup thing that people maybe would, would be interested in, just related to what you're talking about, um, not in a good way. It's called <laughs> Tilt Floor. Not in a, a good way. It's a, it's a startup that says, uh, mass text a bunch of people in a crowd and tell them, <laughs> That's totally scary. Yes. And, and, and so, business. yeah. Well, so this is like, again, we come into this thing where it's like, I occasionally people say to me, like, is that democracy? I can't talk about electronic democracy without somebody saying terrorism at me when we start to talk about, like, stuff that is very private, right? Because obviously it can be abused. Obviously it can be abused. Uh, but on the other hand, it's like, could it be used? Could it be productive? I think so. And I'm not going to assume that if I put these things out that there's going to be evil. Or in some ways, like one of my friends be like, it's horrible. <laughs> it's like, yeah, motivates the crowd to be on your side. Oh, <laughs> not so much, not so much, right? OK, more questions? Go ahead. I, that's community dependent, again. Um, I would have to say that, uh, and I keep saying that, but it really is true. It's like, you, in some cases, you would want to authenticate more frequently, and in other cases, let it go. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, have you looked at uh, various blockchain derivative technologies for, like, um, in terms of like Ethereum, uh, blockchain, you know, other uh, transactions that are going to add to certain kinds of concepts? Uh -huh. Yeah. Oh, cool. Cool. Uh, anyway, uh, and Bitcoin is another example of blockchain. Yeah. 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 So the next, I'm going to go on to the final part of this. Um, Imagines is this word, and not imagine. And it's the plural of the word imago. Um, and imago, we started talking, when we start talking about, OK, so now we have moved from the point where we're just talking about um, identification and rules within a traditional online community. Then we talked about third-party verification. 
Then we talked about peer identification without using a third party or a government ID. And now we're gonna say like, well, the weak point in that is that we're actually like um, putting something on the internet. And there's, you know, the internet is fraught with peril. You know, it's not necessarily secure. And for people who are really concerned about sovereignty in their virtual nation, then maybe this would be an issue. So an imago is, um, an imago is a word for uh, the sexually mature stage of an insect. And like when you have, it has other meanings as well, but I know because I love bugs. Um, when you have like uh, the family Hymenoptera, which is ants and bees and stuff, there's a queen in the nest. And if you destroy the queen, they might make a new queen, but they might just crash and burn. You might be able to get the whole nest. Um, termites are different. And one of the ways that they're different is that termites have both um, a king and a queen. And all of the other ones, the larva, or the active, the semi-mature larva, at a point, if you kill the king or the queen, anything else can become a, re a reproductive. It can mature. And that's why it's so hard to get rid of termites, right? Because anybody can be the queen. Anybody could be the king. You know, so they are distributed in terms of their like gendered abilities. Um, I started thinking about what does this mean in terms of citizenship? Because we talk about democracy and it's obviously we're in representational democracies, but direct democracy is difficult for a variety of reasons. When I think about electronic democracy, I started to wonder if the status quo in server architecture was inherently about a hierarchy. Can you build a distributed democracy? Even if you're building a distributed democracy, like with the kind of cloud architecture that I work with, you know, where we call ourselves a distributed system, I still have server client roles all over the place. You know, those, it's not like I can like pull one of my clients when I wreck one of my servers, right? They're still different. Um, and centralized servers in the same way when we talk about like the bank has your ID, you know, the bank has your financial information or the government has your ID. Centralized servers mean centralized control. And if somebody can grab the servers, then you're, there's gonna be security issues around that. The other thing that made me start thinking about this is just the rarity in our lives as citizens to exercise civic responsibility and to consider systems where there was actually some repercussion or implication for not being responsible. And what we have for civic responsibility right now is, you know, maybe you vote. Maybe you vote once every four years. We don't vote very often. I'm interested in deliberative systems in part because I think if people practice democracy, they'll get better at it. If they vote more, they'll get better at it. If they deliberate, they'll get better at it. They'll make better decisions and everything will move faster and smoother. Maybe I'm just an optimist. But what I started thinking about as we're getting into smaller and smaller server architectures, and I work with Docker at my job. We have like a containerized architecture, and people are spinning up Docker containers that are Linux servers that are like 10 megabytes, you know? There's a whole fetish on making like tiny containers that can be servers. So, and on top of that, I also work all day on command line. And command line tools are just lean and mean, and you can put them on your phone, right? So can we have a server and some kind of tooling on a phone where we're basically gonna talk about this is, this is running the government? Like can we, we always make jokes about this at my job too, like can we just run the whole infrastructure off our phones? But <laughs> no, we can't. But on something else, like another way to think about it is like how much of your political life is actually revolving around that one vote that you made every four years. Like it might be more useful to be voting a lot more frequently on stuff that is around you all the time that you have personal experience with. So if we were gonna talk about having a distributed democracy that was running off like microservers, then we would, one thing, we have a really small cache. Like the amount of data that you can pass about the vote that's going on between everybody in the community um, is gonna be pretty small. Like just in general, you don't have storage space, right? 
The other one, though, that we could go with on that is the idea that you would have tiered caching for relevance. This is to say that the amount of data that you're going to carry, say that you have a server on your phone, and when you interact with other people on some kind of a non-internet or over some kind of a network, um, any kind of a network, really, we could say, the interactions that you have are going to pass information about the votes that are in play, about the political actions that are in play. You may be involved in a variety of deliberations at any given time. The ones that are most important are the ones that are going to affect you day to day. That's where your decisions are best. In the world, your relatively small world where you live, this is not the same kind of community. And when I start talking about fit, this is obviously not the same kind of community as diaspora. You know, or people who really need like the internet and go over long spaces. But on the other hand, um, for hyper-local communities, you might be able to vote a lot more often and then just have a smaller cache of information that represents like your state and your federal. And I use those words just because in terms of virtual democracies, we don't have something that is a state or a federation. We would just say there's bigger and there's bigger and there's bigger. And at some point, there may be, it's going to be much slower because say that you, you spend most of your time in this one community, but once in a while you go to a conference in Portland. I live in Seattle and I'll come down to Portland. So the people that I talk to less, but I see once in a while, which was like the Portland crew or anybody on the edges of my Seattle territory, I may be participating in, in a vote with them, but less frequently because I see them less. So I'm caching less information. I'm not a hyperlocal voter there. I'm like voting on the state level. So this is like the idea of bubble up voting and that it's going to take a lot longer to make decisions that are big decisions with a lot of people involved. You may only make those decisions like you may only be voting on those a couple times a year, but you could be voting on stuff in your own environment a lot more frequently with just an ongoing rolling election where people are trying to take action on stuff. I love Microsoft clip art, by the way. <laughs> so the, like the thing on this, I'm sure there are people in here. I have just really started to look at this in part because of like where my job is, is that I'm totally just a cloud architect. So I don't get to play around with like really funky networking technologies. But since I started talking about this, um, people like are always approaching me with like cool networking technologies that I've never even heard of uh, and different kinds of ways to set it up. Um, Bluetooth and local wireless networks were like kind of the obvious ones. Um, if you're going to make something where people can just walk around and connect to each other and maybe check in with some kind of a device and be like, oh, I have to vote on the trash pickup or something, you know? Um, and like what kind of device can support like a distributed democracy is another question. So the requirements that I'm thinking about this is just that it has to be lightweight. It has to have secure protocols or possibly be anonymous in some communities. Uh, there has to be a fairly high level of technical literacy because if you're making something this lightweight um, and it has implications about server stuff in it, people have to kind of understand their tooling. And there's going to be certain thresholds for citizen density because we're basing it on you know, some kind of communication with citizens in an, in an immediate area in most cases. Consequences of this, it's a duocracy, meaning that the people who participate the most are the people with the power, right? Um, that is a problem or not, depending upon the community. You know, there, it means that somebody could be really noisy and vote, 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 or move around a lot. Do you just have more political power because you like are, I don't know, traveling a circuit as a salesman? I don't know what that means. Um, it's, can it, I, is it a problem? I don't know. I mean, that's very interesting. It, one of the things where, that keeps this just from being a hive is that you would still, if you're going to make a virtual nation this way, you would still want to have a constitution. And that constitution would be probably carried on the phones um, or on the small devices, the laptops, whatever they need to be. Because anything that's just like a swarm where we're voting on stuff, you're going to have problems with long-term plannings and with semantic drift and with goals. So having a strong constitution in this scenario is probably really a good idea. And of course, from my last talk, the, t the tyranny of structurelessness is always impending on um, this kind of a scenario, right? Where um, everything will just succumb to uh, 
natural authority or the star system or the people who travel a lot or you know you put, like political power could belong to people just by not through virtue or through consideration but just because there's someplace good in the flow so some considerations Time is a resource, and this is kind of an effective, potentially like an effective use of time that you just participate on a much more local level more frequently. Um, Non-participation is punishable because you're not gonna be, you're not gonna have any political voice if you don't participate. That's somewhat true in our politics today, you know? Um, we do have, we do our presidential elections, all of our elections are held as duocracies. You show up on the day to vote, or you don't vote. There's no meaningful abstention. The people who voted are the ones that get to elect the, pre the president. And I'm often, like this is one thing that I do, again, I do like about Robert's Rules of Order is meaningful abstention. And in certain communities that works and it's very good. Um, and sometimes you can't ever pull it off and a duocracy is the way to go. Be interesting to see in this scenario what it means to, to have peer nations and multiple overlapping citizens. And one of, the ways, one of the ways that you could actually see your nation is through some kind of third party thing. So my, my friend Peaches is the one who brought this up with me because he's got a friend that's thinking about it too. And if we just had some kind of like ambiguous network, how would we ever know what the decisions, how would we ever get a big picture? And the idea is, is that if you had these kind of swarms that had constitutions and political influence of some sort, there would be a vested interest in some people in monitoring the swarms, right? Just because you're mostly closed doesn't mean that you don't occasionally have an internet gateway where information is feeding in or touch points or trusted users somehow that are going to be like sending information out of the world that, that are talking about that. And so part of your community could be that somebody else is watching your community, like almost like the stock market. Like you could go in and see, people are interested in what you're thinking because you have political influence, you're kind of a nation. And so are other people gonna check into a website and be like, what is that? What is that cluster up to? Or what is that hive up to, right? I really don't know how that works and it's like some crazy, Stuff. But the minimal viable product on this, <laughs> says Jeff, is like the ballot box and the soap box. Like have some place where people can vote and have that be like a separate channel. We essentially talked about this in terms of like exploratory deliberations where people can like go say whatever they want. Um, understand each other's ideas, understand each other's conversations, have some kind of guided conversation that's helping people like figure out where they're at. And then a ballot box, is, which is just switches, where actual elections are taking place. That's much smaller data, right? That's discrete data about this is how we're voting. <sighs> Questions on this part? Go ahead. Yeah. No, it's not always a good idea. It's totally about fit. I mean, I think um, we see the repercussions of non-participation in our own political system all the time, and I don't like it. I, however, think that you talk about communities, one of the places where it makes most obvious sense to have a virtual democracy or a virtual government um, is within the technocracy itself, like that developers, offices full of developers, like would have applications where they're making decisions or de developer cooperatives or whatever that is, you know, because they have the technology, they have the, techni the technical literacy. Um, and in that community, which is, it depends upon what you're voting on, I think that the, the concerns of a virtual nation are not the same as the concerns of a physical nation. And so maybe you don't have to worry about healthcare, for example, right? That's a physical world thing, um, or it could be, but, um, I think that there's definitely places where 
it makes sense for a community that might work, like good enough voter verification. This whole talk is about like, is it good enough? Is it good enough for somebody? Is it good enough for anybody? Who would use this? Is there a place for it? I don't know. Other questions? Go ahead. Constitution, yeah, that comes up the Constitution question again. Yeah. Absolutely. So very much, I said that there, I have been preoccupied with the justice system. Like I have no idea what a justice system should be, but it, when we look at you constitution on one point, which is the birth of a nation, where they get together and they aspire, they, they state their aspirations. But one of the things that's really um, important about a justice system is, is how you iterate and amend your constitution. In a lot of cases, is what the decisions are made, how the decisions are made. And I'm not sure what the role is, but that is critical for that issue, right? how are we gonna actually manage and respect the rights of our citizens if we don't have a justice system in place? Like, I perceive that there's a whole lot of, there's a whole lot of things that I could think about here. I came up and I just gave a discussion on ideas that I had that kind of went down this track, but this is a talk about identity architecture in electronic democracy. All these other things have to be solved. Like, you know, how do we actually vote just within, not even talking about deliberation, but just talking about like voting pathologies and voting systems and voting schemes. You know, the, the critical questions about what a justice system is, what, uh, how much security is good security. You know, lots of like, because what do you do? What do you, do you have an army? You know, that also is like part of your security and defense kind of stuff. There's a lot of things that go in a nation. And how do you treat these things, and the, mo the most important thing that I hold is that nations are made up of citizens and resources, right? And I just keep coming back to that and saying, like, who are the citizens? What are their resources? And I don't have very specific use cases. I think that there are a lot of useful things, and one of the reasons why I'm glad to come out and talk about the ideas that I have is that maybe somebody else can use it, and you never know, right? Some of this might be useful for somebody else. Other questions? Okay, I just want to thank all of these people, um, the developers that I work with, you for coming. Um, you can totally stay in touch with me. Um, I'm Ellie Moonjelly on Twitter. I feel free to email me. I am I'm here until Friday, so just hit me up in the halls whenever you see me. But by all means, send me an email because I decided at some point I wanted to keep thinking about these things. But I'm terrible, I might be published once in a while, but I'm terrible about blogging or anything. On the other hand, if somebody emails me with a question, I will answer it. If I get it, I will answer it. And some of the most productive things for me in terms of crafting ideas, all my ideas, I open this thing, like all my ideas come out of dialogue. All my ideas come out of collaboration and discussions. So if you email me, then I'll email you back and it will really help me like form my ideas. Thank you.